Hi, I'm Brandon Grazley. I teach high school computer science, and in my grade 12 class, my students have to write a class called student, which would be used as part of a student information system. Each object represents a specific student in a school. We have to store the first and last name, the grade of the student, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, that sort of thing, uh, the timetable of eight courses that they'll take in a year, as well as uh, one more thing I forgot to list here, but I, I do later down. They need to store the student number as a string, uh, just in case it has dashes or something like that in it. So down below here, I've given a, a long list of, of the documented methods, what each thing does. And so I'm just going to move over here to uh, NetBeans. This is the development environment that we use for the course. And so I've begun by filling in uh, all of that stuff from the documentation. I've just sort of cut and paste all of the, all of the documentation and the methods down in here. The only thing I haven't done is actually written the code to go inside of the methods. Now if you're in my course, I'm going to be posting a zip file of this project uh, in the course environment. Now down here, for example, you'll notice this won't compile yet because methods like this one, get first name, have to return a string, and I haven't done that yet. So we will get to that very soon. Before we do, let's look at the field variables that I've uh, put into the class here. So we're just inside the class declaration. There's the open brace. All of these variables here, you see they're colored in green in NetBeans. They are not inside of a method, and so they are all field variables. So let's see what we have. We have first and last name. We have the student number as a string. Grade is an int. And then we have a, a string array called timetable. Now we need to initialize all of these values, all these variables. We do that in the constructor, which we begin here. The constructor for a student object requires first and last student number and grade. Notice it doesn't require any timetable stuff. So you kind of create a student and then you create their timetable separately. Uh, so let's start off by assigning the value from the parameter first and sticking it into first name. First is this parameter here. We're going to store its value in the field variable first name. In NetBeans it's nice when you click on a variable you see all the instances of it even in comments like this. So you'll be able to find um, find all of the, the instances. I'm going to do the same thing here for last name. And then let's do student number. Now notice that student number is both the name of the field variable and this local parameter variable. Now that's a problem. So if I click on this one, for example, NetBeans is going to highlight it and let me know that, hey, all of those are the same. Well, that's not good. What I want to do is take this value here and store it in this variable here. So to reference this field variable, <coughs> excuse me, we need to use a keyword, this dot. So what that will do, pardon me, what that will do is um, instead of referencing the local variable student number, this parameter, it goes outside to the larger uh, object itself, the student object, and finds the field variable of that name. And we could do this up here as well. We could say, this dot first name and this dot last name and that will reference those variables directly. It's not a bad practice to do that. This dot grade equals grade is another one that we can do then. In fact we would have to. Okay so let's initialize our um, timetable string array. So timetable currently is null, it has no value. So we will make it equal to a new string array and what we do is put a value inside of this, uh, these uh, sort of square brackets to say how many elements it should have. We want to be able to store eight courses, so we have eight elements. Okay, so we've initialized our student object, um, stored all the values, and, and created a timetable array to store everything. Let's go down and do some setters and getters, these accessor methods. This one is to set the first name. We're going to do exactly the same thing as before. This dot first name equals new first name. New first name that's not the keyword new, that's just a variable name. We're going to do the same thing down lower for the last name. Here we want to get the first name. We return this dot first name. Oops. And once again, we don't have to use the, the keyword this here, but it's not a bad practice. Here we are going to use this dot uh, last name equals new last name. And this one to return the last name. Set grade. Uh, that's this dot grade equals new grade. And 
get grade, return this dot grade. Okay, so each of those is just a way for us to be able to retrieve or modify each of the variables that is stored with each student object. So to use that, you would call you know students uh, the student you know a student um, variable sorry like my student and you would call my student dot get grade and it would return the grade that is stored in the my student object. We're going to practice that a little further down here. Okay. Now, let's look at the set course method. It takes two parameters, the block number, 1 through 8, and a course code. So we're on Ontario here, so the course codes are things like ICS4U. That's this course. So let's do that. Let's start filling this stuff in. We're going to take timetable at a particular spot. We're going to deal with that in a second. And we're going to set that value equal to the course code. Now the spot to put it in. The block number goes from 1 to 8, but the timetable indices, the index values in the array, go from 0 to 7. They're all off by 1. So we take block and subtract 1 from it. So if the block number were 3, this would be 3 minus 1, which is 2. The third position in the array is at position index 2. So we've uh, set that course code. That's fine. Let's return to get course. Now you might try to do this, return timetable at block minus one. That'd be a good instinct, good starting place. However, there is a bit of a problem. So, so we've referenced the right spot, but what if there is no course stored there yet? Let me just scroll back up here. When you first create a string array like this, strings are objects, so when you make an array of any of objects, and haven't filled it in, each of those references inside the object, inside the, sorry, each of the references inside the array are all null. They don't point to actual objects yet. They're sort of blank. And so down here, when we want to get a course from block three, let's say, if you haven't filled in block three yet, this is gonna be a null value. And that's not what we want. Instead, look, take a look here in the documentation. If, sorry, if there is no scheduled course, it returns this phrase here, no course scheduled. Well, that actually gives us the if statement that we're going to use. If there's no course scheduled, what would that look like? Timetable at block minus one, the one that we're referencing. If it were equal to null, then there would be no course scheduled. So we will return no course scheduled as the result. Otherwise, return timetable. Now, I can also I don't have to, but I could put else return the timetable value at block uh, at index block minus one. I don't actually have to use the else because if the if fires and I get this, this uh, line here, 114, will return from the get course method and the remaining part of the method here will never run. So if we get into the if block, we're going to return. If we don't get into the if block, we could return. But we might as well use an if else structure, that's fine. Okay, let's get down to get full name. Basically, we're gonna take the first name, put a space, and then the last name. So I'm gonna do this is good practice here to build a result string instead of just trying to return it all at once. Don't want you to make a boo-boo. It's better to build it all up front. So we're gonna take first name and then the last name. So uh, first name and then a space in double quotes and then the last name. We still have to return that value, so we return result. Now notice I used the variable name result because that's what I'm trying to make. So rather than temp or i or k or l or some other variable name that's not very meaningful, use good variable names. It's much easier to read. Return the result. That's pretty easy to read. Okay, let's go down here. Get timetable. Okay, this is going to return a string representation of the entire timetable. So once again, I'm going to build up a result string. And it has, let me just go back to the definition up here. There we go. Here's the timetable, a bunch of equal signs, and then the blocks with each course code listed beside it. Okay, so I want, to begin with, I might as well put a timetable, and then a new line character, a bunch of equal signs. Another new line character. Okay, that's where we're going to start. And now to that, I'm going to add on each of the course values. So let's have a loop to do that. 
an index value. We're going to start it at zero. We're going to go to the end of the course uh, timetable. Now I could put the number eight here, but it's just in case we end up changing something like the size of the array later, perhaps we should be more careful. Let's do timetable dot length, which keeps track of the size of that array, and index plus plus to increment it. So this is going to go through positions zero through seven one at a time. At each time, we're going to take result and re and change it to be the old result. So in this case, we're going to start with the timetable and these equal signs. And then we will add the phrase block, put a space. Now the block number is one more than the index value. So in brackets, put index plus one. It will evaluate that number, because the index is a number, plus one, and then that whole thing will get stuck in the middle of this string here. So you gotta put it in brackets or this doesn't work right. You'll have uh, the index value and then, uh, then the one will be like tacked on right after. Okay, so block whatever equals, or sorry, colon, put a space, and then we want to get the course code in here. Now, do not put timetable at index. Instead, we call get course code at index plus one. So that, oh, is it not get course code? Oh, sorry, it's just get course. That's why it's underlining here. Oops. So what that does is it goes and retrieves the course code, but remember, we already built in this functionality here. If there is no course, it's going to put this phrase, no course scheduled. <coughs> Pardon me. And let me see, one more thing. We're going to need a new line character somewhere. Well, I don't actually want a new line character at the end. I only want it at the beginning if we need a new line. So I'm going to go back up here, take that one out. And I'm going to put it in over here. That way we only get the new line when we need it. Okay, so that's going to go through each time and plunk the new course values on there. Let's just see if we got everything we need. Okay, that looks pretty good. Well, I think we've done everything except for actually returning the final value. So let's do that, return result. It looks like my errors have all disappeared now. Let's try it out. I put I made a main method here. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, where I put a bunch of stuff into the um, into a student object, and then we returned it all. Now this is not thorough testing. This is just the very beginning, but I'll uh, I'll explain it to you once we get uh, once the course once the program runs. Sorry, this is the first filed something in my computer on here, so. It's always a little slower at the beginning. Let's see. So I had made a new student called John Smith with this course code, or sorry, this uh, student number and the grade nine. And I plunked in these course codes in spots one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight. So nothing in spot number four. So I looked down here and that worked correctly. Block four was blank and the others were all in the right order. What if I change the order here, move this down there, put AMG 40 it's in spot seven. I just happened to declare it later. I could run this again and make sure that the timetable still prints out correctly. Very good. Um, we could also do some things like system.out.println. Uh, let's do the full name. And that would be uh, my student is called s, so s dot uh, get full name. Could run that. So this is just a little bit of very basic testing to see if this is working right. John Smith. What if we set the first name here? S dot set first name to Jane. Try running that again. So I would expect it'll say full name Jane Smith at the bottom. Let's just make sure that worked. And it did. Okay, so that's some very basic testing. Now remember, this part here, this main method, this is not part of the class itself. This isn't something that's necessary to be uh, to have a student object. That's just something I threw in there for some testing purposes. It's not a bad idea to have it there, but it might be better to put it into a testing object. For, uh, for example, here inside of the project, I have a student Java file. I can make another one for testing, and the main method would go there instead of here inside student. It might be a little bit better practice. 
Okay, so we built a student, it stores a bunch of stuff, and we have a bunch of accessor methods that can uh, change things and retrieve things, as well as a couple specialty things for uh, getting uh, a course timetable printed off. So I hope that helps and uh, clears up any confusion that you've been having, and hopefully it also uh, teaches you a little bit about how objects work. So if you have any questions, please ask down in the comments below. Uh, feel free to share this video out. And if you're one of my students, of course, you can get a hold of me in a variety of ways through the course environment or the other services that we use. And I look forward to talking to you. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day.